Hey there, welcome to Learn English with Josh. I'm Josh. I will be your guide on your English learning journey. In this episode, we are going to discuss one of the most important but one of the most feared elements of learning English, of learning any language, in fact, and that is making mistakes. English learners try to avoid making mistakes at all costs. I am guilty of this in all of the languages that I've tried to learn. I am guilty of this same capital linguistic sin because in my mind, if I don't speak, hey, look, I don't make mistakes. Problem solved. <laughs> no speaking, no mistakes made. Perfect solution. Wrong. Making mistakes is one of the fundamental practices in learning a language. Because what's important when you make a mistake in, in the, the language learning context, you can get the feedback so you can avoid making those mistakes in the future. If you don't know you're making a mistake, you don't know you're making a mistake and you will continue to make those mistakes. So, in this episode, we're going to talk about a big mistake that was made by one of my students, and an even possibly bigger mistake that was made by a personal friend of mine who was learning Portuguese. So, we're going to discuss that and other elements of making mistakes. So, sit back, Relax and enjoy the episode. Learning a language is a messy process. Just because you receive feedback on a mistake that you have made does not mean that you will avoid that mistake in the future. You may need to hear that feedback on that particular mistake many times, multiple times. And unsurprisingly, that is part of the learning process. Receiving multiple instances of feedback after making a particular mistake, understanding and then correcting so as to avoid that mistake in the future. But not all mistakes are equal. <laughs> there are some mistakes that are so terribly egregious, that are so terribly, I will call them gross in terms of how large and how extensively outside the accepted norms of language they are, that they cause laughter, they cause mirth, they cause merriment in the listener. These mistakes may cause the person you are talking to to burst into uproarious laughter. I, as an English teacher, am guilty of this. Sometimes my students will make such a mistake and I will laugh. No, students, I love you. I am not laughing at you. I am laughing with you. <laughs> I am laughing at the imagery that you have placed inside my head from the language you have produced. And this is what I find to be the beauty of language. The words we utter, the words we speak, the words that we produce, when combined in a certain order or a certain sequence, create images in our minds. Our mind's eye, which is the, the visual image we keep inside of our brain, our mind's eye, analyzes the words that are said and unconsciously projects a very specific image in our mind's eye. And sometimes, because of the mistake, the image that is created is so extraordinarily far outside of the expected that it makes us laugh. It makes us think. It makes us stop. It makes us kind of check 
our own understanding and our own interpretation of that image simply because of the sequence and combinations of words that the English learner chose, which happen to be a combination or a sequence or a mispronunciation that native speakers have determined is outside of the norm. Or, in other words, a mistake. I would like to take a couple of minutes right now first to expound on, to expand this idea of the images that our words create. And then I would like to talk about a specific mistake that one of my students committed, a terribly grievous pronunciation mistake that literally made me cry from laughing. He was unsure of the mistake when he made it, and I had to explain it, and then he began to laugh uproariously. So it was actually a really important moment of combined understanding of the mistake, and uh, probably I can almost guarantee that this mistake will never be made by this particular student in the future, ever. So first, I would like to read a, a short segment from the book The Language Instinct by Steven Pinker. He is a much smarter person than I am. He is a linguist at Harvard University. And I agree with him on this particular subject. On others, I have some disagreement, but that is for another podcast episode. First, The Language Instinct by Steven Pinker. Chapter 1. An Instinct to Acquire an Art. As you are reading these words, you are taking part in one of the wonders of the natural world. For you and I belong to a species with a remarkable ability. We can shape events in each other's brains with exquisite precision. I am not referring to telepathy or mind control or the other obsessions of fringe science. Even in the depictions of believers, these are blunt instruments compared to an ability that is uncontroversially present in every one of us. That ability is language. Simply by making noises with our mouths, we can reliably cause precise new combinations of ideas to arise in each other's minds. The ability comes so naturally that we are apt to forget what a miracle it is. So let me remind you with some simple demonstrations. Asking you only to surrender your imagination to my words for a few moments, I can cause you to think some very specific thoughts. Now this is Josh speaking. The paragraphs that Steven Pinker used were, in my opinion, a little bit too advanced for this episode. So I decided to create my own paragraphs more or less in line with Steven Pinker's ideas. I intend to create a very precise image in your mind. Are you ready? Let's go. Margot took her in his arms and kissed her passionately on the lips. She wrapped her arms around him in a lover's embrace and kissed him back furiously. Marco tasted blood on his lips. The pain was a glorious pleasure. They fell together onto the bed, and their lovemaking was the most intense experience she had ever had in her life. When the fastened seatbelt light comes on, calmly remove your life vest from under your seat. Place it over your head, Assume the crash position with your head on your arms against the seat in front of you and prepare for a water landing. Dry skin rule number three. Exfoliate weekly. 
dead skin cells can build up on the surface of your skin, causing it to look dull. Exfoliation can help remove the buildup. So, if you have dry skin, try adding an exfoliating face scrub to your skin care routine. Pay attention to how your skin responds so you can choose how often you should exfoliate your dry skin. Hopefully you were able to understand those three examples and each example projected in your mind's eye, according to your understanding, a relatively precise image of what was going on. Maybe in the skincare paragraph, you imagined placing moisturizing lotion onto your skin and rubbing it to make your skin glow and shine. Possibly in the second paragraph, you imagined a terrible plane crash. You could maybe even imagine the seat in front of you with the tray and the little television screen. And possibly the first paragraph is not appropriate to listen to at work, um, but it did create and project a particular image inside your mind's eye. So, all of this that I have been talking about is simply an introduction <laughs> to the mistake one of my students made. And in my opinion, probably one of the most hilarious exchanges that I have had with a student. So after I have created all of this expectation, <laughs> I, I hope that we can all enjoy the mistake that this student made and know that making mistakes is part of the whole process. And if we can laugh about it, that just makes the process that much more enjoyable. So without further ado, I will give you some context to this great mistake. During one of my classes with my student, he will remain nameless to protect the innocent, Though he is guilty of making this mistake, he will remain anonymous, Miguel. Uh, <laughs> um, we were talking about the difficulties of managing many different things at the same time and about how our daily lives had become overwhelmed with responsibilities. This conjured in my mind the story of a little boy. This story is actually, I don't know if it's a fable or um, a fairy tale, but it's a story. I don't know if it's true or not, but it's a story that is told to evoke some sense of morality or fundamental human ethics. And in this case, this story was about a little boy from Holland. Now, Holland in Europe is also called the Netherlands. The Netherlands meaning the low country. Now, if you know anything about Holland, first of all, people from Holland are called Dutch. They speak a language called Dutch, which is different than German which in German is Deutsch. So the people from Holland, the Dutch, speak Dutch. Their nationality is Dutch. So the little boy from this story is the little Dutch boy. Many Americans, or I don't know if the English have this story, but in my family, in my experience, in my community, this story was known as the little Dutch boy. However, the original title is called The Little Hero of Harlem. Harlem, you may know, is a neighborhood in uptown Manhattan in New York City. And you may not know this, but New York City's previous name was New Amsterdam. So that area was originally colonized by the Dutch. Hmm. Harlem and New Amsterdam... And that is a tangent that I went on. I tend to do that. So now I will bring us back to the story at hand. 
the little Dutch boy. The story goes that this little Dutch boy was faced with overwhelming challenges, overwhelming obstacles, more than he could handle on his own or by himself. But when he was confronted with obstacles and challenges that were more than he alone could handle, he continued, he persevered, he persisted, and eventually help came to save the day. This little Dutch boy overcame his challenges. He overcame the obstacles that were in front of him and persevered and survived and became the little hero of Harlem. The second thing you might know about Holland, the Netherlands, the Low Countries, is that much of the country is actually below the level of the sea. And in order to protect this very fertile land that belongs to the Dutch countryside, the Dutch have become master architects. They have become master controllers of the land. They have learned to create structures to prevent the ocean from intruding into their country and taking over the land. And these structures you may know as dams. One of the words that you can use to talk about this kind of structure is a dam. A dam prevents water or other material from penetrating, from coming through. A dam holds back the water, thus protecting the area downstream. And the Dutch were masters at constructing these different structures. But the mistake in this whole grandiose story comes from a vocabulary word that is synonymous with the word dam. A dam generally holds back water and creates a reservoir behind it. It creates a lake, some larger body of water. In English, the correct word for the structures that the Dutch constructed is a dike. A dike is actually a long wall that specifically prevents seawater from entering. A dam can be used to prevent river water from flowing. A dike is a structure that prevents the flooding of seawater onto the land. Now, let's get back to the little Dutch boy and his heroism. The little Dutch boy and his brother were walking along the countryside alongside one of these dikes. And luckily, the little Dutch boy noticed that there was a small hole in the side of the dike. And through that hole, the seawater was flowing. And the little Dutch boy thought, if I don't prevent this seawater from entering, the hole will become bigger and bigger, and the sea will come crashing onto the land and will destroy the villages in the area. So the little Dutch boy sent his brother back to the village to bring help. And he, in an effort to protect all the villages in the area, stuck his finger into this big dike to prevent the seawater from coming through. Now he stayed there for hours and hours. His hands became colder and colder as the seawater was freezing. And he noticed that though his finger was in there, stopping the flow of the ocean, the hole was becoming bigger and bigger. The water was becoming stronger and stronger behind this big dike that soon the boy would not be able to prevent the dike from breaking and destroying the villages in the area. And this little Dutch boy was becoming desperate. His finger was stuck in this big dike, but he knew that he was going to lose the battle against the elements, against the sea, but he kept his little finger stuck in that big dike. 
you might be able to deduce or to understand from the title of this story, The Little Hero of Harlem, that the little Dutch boy succeeded in stopping the flow of the ocean long enough for the villagers to come and repair the big dike. So, as I began to mention the story of the little Dutch boy to my student, he was actually familiar with the little Dutch boy and his heroism and his perseverance in sticking his finger in that big dike to save the villages from certain destruction. However, and here comes the big mistake, in his excitement to tell me that, in fact, he knew about this story, he said, Oh, of course, I know the story about the little Dutch boy who stuck his finger in the big dick. <laughs> it's still hard for me not to laugh. So, the mistake here is in the pronunciation of a single word a single vowel sound that changes the image that comes unconsciously into your mind's eye. <laughs> the story, as I knew it, was a little Dutch boy and a big dike, a big dam, a big barrier to ocean water. The image he cast into my brain was of a little Dutch boy putting his finger in a massive penis. <laughs> the image appears, like I said, unconsciously. You cannot stop the image because the words project meaning into your mind's eye, whether you want them to or not. So, I'm laughing until today about a little Dutch boy, his finger in a big penis. So, Miguel, thank you for the laughter. Thank you for a funny story. Thank you for a fun memory. And you're welcome. You will never, ever in your life mistake a dyke for a dick. And for those of you, I please forgive me the vulgarity, the word dick is a vulgar term for the male penis. <laughs> so, we have that to think about. But now you are asking me, Teacher Josh, the title of this podcast episode is half a dozen French penises, please. What does that have to do with Dutch penises? Well, absolutely nothing. But this was the unfortunate mistake of someone else I know, uh, an American, a, a personal friend of mine in Brazil, where we live. His story also revolves around the mispronunciation of a particularly difficult sound for Americans to say in Portuguese. In Brazil, we speak Portuguese. And the word for bread in Portuguese is pão. Pão is a very nasally sound. The nose is obstructed. Boom, boom. But my friend's pronunciation at the time in Portuguese was not that exemplary. It was not very good. And because of the difficulty of saying the word boom, what came out of his mouth was the word pau. Boom, bread, pau, penis. <laughs> so we have another penis story. My poor friend, when he went into the bakery, instead of ordering half a dozen of French baguettes or French loaves of bread, my friend asked for half a dozen French penises, please. 
Now, I was not there to witness this. I did not see this. But I would have liked to have seen the expression on the face of the person who took the request, who took my friend's order for six French penises. I can imagine that he might have said, Sir, we don't sell French penises here. We sell French bread. You may want to go to a different store for French penises. <laughs> so, my mind is a child's mind, and apparently you might think everything comes back to penises. Well, let's, let's end this episode on mistakes on a high note, shall we? A less vulgar note. The point, the objective of this particular episode is to reassure you, is to make you feel better about the fact that making mistakes is an essential part of the learning process for any language, for any ability. And we can laugh at some of our mistakes because, in actuality, those mistakes are really funny. And there is no shame in making mistakes. We should be happy that we get the necessary feedback when we do make mistakes so that we can avoid making those disastrous mistakes in the future. And as I said at the beginning, some mistakes are bigger than others. Some mistakes are more consequential than others. But most mistakes that English learners make when they're speaking English are very small and very insignificant and very inconsequential and generally have absolutely nothing to do with penises. Dutch penises or French penises. Thank you for listening to Learn English with Josh. I'm not sure exactly what you have learned from this lesson, but I hope it was at least enjoyable. And if you thought so, please take a moment to subscribe. If you are listening on a podcast platform, hit the subscribe button. If you are listening and watching on my YouTube channel, take a second to subscribe, hit the like button, and while you're on my YouTube channel, I'd really love it if you could leave a comment. Let us know what the worst mistake you have ever made in English was. Or if not you, someone you know. What was their mistake? What was the result? What were the consequences? So let us know about that. And if you are interested, you can go to my website for this particular podcast episode and you will find the original, not in the original Dutch, but the English version of the little Dutch boy, the hero of Harlem, with the audiobook included. It's a very short story. I think you'll enjoy it. So thank you very much, and I will see you next episode. Bye-bye. <laughs>